Talking with your team about practicing evidence-based. How to communicate with your team. Not all SLPs practice the same, and that's okay. Where it gets sticky and even dangerous, though, is when one or more of your team members aren't staying up to date with their practice and are resistant to change. So how do you talk to them about it? The reality is that some people struggle with being made aware of their misguided clinical practice and could get defensive. No one likes to be told they're wrong. I'm going to go over some tips and suggestions around how to best approach your team when talking about evidence-based practice. Let's dive in. I'm Teresa Richard. I've been a medical speech pathologist for 15 years. I'm a board certified specialist in swallowing and swallowing disorders. I'm the founder and CEO of the MedSLP Collective and MedSLP Education. Number one, organize monthly meetings or journal clubs to discuss topics relevant to your facility. Allowing for an open, factual, and objective conversation using published research articles is an excellent way to learn and discuss the evidence. Your team can review the literature, discuss any potential limitations or barriers, and discuss cases anyone may currently be working with and how to apply that evidence to that case today. You might want to lead the discussion with a case of your own, which could take the pressure off of others who may not be ready to feel like they're under the spotlight or being challenged. This would also be a great opportunity to demonstrate your own willingness to evolve your practice. Take ownership of less than ideal practice patterns and break the ice for respectful and maybe even vulnerable discussions for the betterment of your team and patients. A colleague of mine told me a story about a time she went in to see a patient who had head and neck cancer, was NPO with a feeding tube and had just finished his radiation treatment. He did not undergo surgery or chemotherapy, was independently mobile, had clear lungs and no signs or symptoms of infection, and he did whatever his medical team told him to do. He was determined to resume to his normal life activities. Fortunately, he was told not to swallow at all during his radiation treatment, including his own saliva. So he walked around with a cup to spit in. He did, however, keep his mouth and tongue clean and moist as often as he could. He was so diligent about oral care. My colleague had been practicing in the medical setting for four years at this point, but she had just picked up a new contract at this hospital. A more veteran SLP observed her to check off her competencies before letting her fly solo. Being aware of the evidence around oral care, the pillars of aspiration pneumonia, and that swallowing is the best way to improve swallowing, my colleague gave this man several ice chips after he completed another round of oral care and he couldn't have been happier. Tears of joy streamed down his face as he crunched on the ice chips and swallowed without reported difficulty. My colleague knew he needed an instrumental swallow study, so she recommended an MBS and he continued with an ice chip protocol to help keep his mouth moist and encourage more swallowing. As soon as she left the room, the seasoned SLP who was observing her told her that she needed to go back into the room, take the ice chips away and keep him NPO until the MBS. He is too high of an aspiration risk, she told my colleague. This was an extremely tough situation. My friend was brand new to the facility and only working a short-term contract, so she felt like she couldn't object to the full-time seasoned SLP. I think we've all been there before. She did as she was told. The man was devastated, and my friend wanted to make sure this never happened again. Thankfully, this SLP department was already holding monthly journal clubs. So my friend pulled up several research articles specific to head and neck cancer, oral care, the pillars of aspiration pneumonia, and suggested this topic be discussed at the next journal club. The team was agreeable to the topic and allowed for an open discussion on how to take a less fear-based approach, particularly with ice chips, while better understanding how oral care, strength, mobility, the immune system, and aspiration all play a role in assessing the risk of developing aspiration pneumonia. Number two, acknowledge your own growth and former ways of practice. Openly critiquing your own practice by acknowledging how you used to do X until you learned Y helps to remove the sense of finger pointing. Again, it's a very human response to feel personally attacked, embarrassed, or defensive if someone suggests what you're doing could cause harm or have the opposite effect of your goal. No SLP got into this field to cause harm. We all want to help. 
it can be jarring to learn that maybe what you've been doing isn't actually helpful or as helpful as you thought. Showing empathy and building trust can strengthen growth. Another thing to acknowledge is when other colleagues demonstrate evidence-based practice and help their patients achieve their goals. It's so easy to focus on the stressors and challenges that we don't celebrate each other's wins. Even if the win feels small or basic, point it out and celebrate that person. Any step in the right direction is worth flooding with dopamine. We also don't compare our smalls. While we know we can learn from our mistakes, there's actually research published in a 2019 article in Psychological Sciences that shows how we might learn more from our successes. This can be a matter of self-esteem. It doesn't feel good to fail, so people are more likely to tune out. The takeaway with this is that we need to acknowledge areas of necessary growth and celebrate our wins. I personally, I never had access to video fluoroscopy earlier in my career, and fees was really all I had, so I believed fees truly was best. I mean, I still do for a lot of reasons, but it also overshadowed sometimes when a video fluoroscopy really was the better option for our patients. As I've heard other colleagues explain to me in different situations what they've seen from using both, it changed my mind that referring more patients to video fluoroscopy would really help them learn a lot more. I'm grateful to my colleagues that continue to share their wins in that area, which allowed me to expand my thinking. I'll be posting other videos just like this one that you won't want to miss. So make sure to hit that like and subscribe button and turn on the notification bell. Also, do you have any specific questions about the bedside swallow evaluation? Leave a comment below and tell me about it. We'll be sure to get your questions answered as soon as possible. Number three. Bring interprofessional team members on board. You know that saying, it takes a village? You alone can't change an entire work culture. If there is anyone you can find to support you, change is more likely to occur. When you speak with nurses and physicians, share your rationale for the decisions you make. Cite the literature in your notes. While it might sound like overkill, I even suggest giving a printed copy of the research you're pulling from to your interprofessional medical colleagues who either push back or, or maybe want to know more. Bring up the evidence in rounds. Come prepared with citations if you have to. Have one-on-one -on -one discussions with other medical colleagues. If there's anyone who has acknowledged your practice in a positive way, ask for their support. Having a physician champion can be huge for program development. Don't forget, tell the other medical professionals what's in it for them. Why should they be okay without instrumental swallow studies before initiating a diet? Why should nurses stop thickening at the bedside? Look up literature on healthcare costs and patient outcomes. Remember, we all want to save and improve lives. Show them how their decisions using this literature can improve how many lives they save while saving medical costs. I have a story that I want to share with you about a facility that I was working at that had no access to instrumentation. They did not have video fluoroscopy. They did not have fees. Uh, and I was approached by the facility to come in and do fees on all of their patients with thickened liquids. They had 24 patients and they had all been on thickened liquids for years. They were not able to get sent out to the hospital for logistical reasons. So one administrator was very against instrumental studies and just thought that thickened liquids was the be all end all to dysphagia. Long story short, only one of those 24 patients actually ended up really needing to be on the thickened liquids. We ended up saving that facility $48,000 in operating costs in thickener that year. This administrator was elated. He was singing my praises to every other administrator buddy that he had, but it's such a testament to how we can have these beliefs unless someone challenges them and, and actually shows them, they might be more willing to change. I've got a free gift for you at metaslpcollective.com forward slash team. Get access to our email template that will help you start the conversation with your team about practicing evidence-based. The link for that again is metaslpcollective.com forward slash team. It will also be listed in the description below.